uh, without further ado, I think we can start with presentation and Beata Kubitz is the first presenter. Um, so she will, I'm sure, share the screen shortly and introduce herself and her presentation. And uh, I will switch off my camera right now. Three minutes before the time is up, I will switch it on so that you can see me again and know the time is running out and about five, one minute before the 20 minute uh, time slot, I will uh, announce that the time is really running up and it's time to wrap up. And uh, please, Beata, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Uh, th well, thank you, Carol, and hello, everyone. Um, this is the first time I've uh, presented anything about this piece of work, which is funded by the um, Foundation for Integrated Transport. So I hope very much that uh, the other uh, the people from the Foundation are here and that they are approving of this, uh, this piece of research. Um, my name is Beata Kubitz and I'm not an academic. I, I'm, I'm slightly daunted by following um, great uh, Greg Marsden um, and, and his highlighting of the um, carbon dot place tool, uh, which I started to use recently in, in doing this piece of work. Um, so the, the, the most interesting, the, the, the talk is about the challenge of decarbonising transport in peri-urban areas. And as, as Greg highlighted, everywhere is different. Um, and if you look at the carbon dot place tool, which I highly recommend that you do, it, it gives an absolutely amazing picture of the country and, uh, and areas that we all know, to, know very well. And, and some of the things that we suspected um, about decarbonisation and peri urban areas are highlighted in, in glorious technical or actually in red. Um, that's uh, where, where we have very high levels of carbon output. The blue areas, these areas in the centre of um, Manchester, which is the place we're looking at and which is where my case studies um, centre, are lower, lower um, areas for carbon emissions, the people who are already have relatively low carbon footprints. Um, and and it's, it's great that cities are much lower per person in carbon emissions. Uh, and it's interesting to look at why cities are lower in carbon emissions than um, rural areas. Um, uh, but we have a tendency not only to live in areas outside of cities, but also to aspire to live in areas outside of cities. I mean, there is both the, the rural economy, which draws people to work within it, and then there is the, actually, we do, a lot of us would like to look at green hills and, and, and grass and leaves, um, or at least for part of our days. Uh, and this has been highlighted in the last couple of the last year since the pandemic um, came to uh, roost in our lives as the stampede from city centres uh, to uh, rural um, or more rural or more suburban areas has been highlighted in vastly increasing house, house prices outside of uh, city centres. Um, so the, the, the good thing about the, uh, the carbon dot place um, uh, uh, website and, and tool is that it gives you a really graphic um, idea of carbon emissions and it gives you a really graphic uh, idea about different sorts of carbon emissions. Um, th this is Greater Manchester again, it shows you how um, those carbon emissions are very much um, related to car use. Uh, centre of Manchester, much lower car, car emissions, outside um, uh, the central area, much higher car emissions. And whilst the tool actually uses a percentage um, uh, kind of uh, approach to, um, to carbon emissions with the best 1% and the best 10% and the worst 1% and the worst 10%, I think we need to also remember that this translates into absolute numbers. Um, the highest, the worst 1% um, are, of emissions are generating over a thousand kilograms of CO2, a ton each, more than a ton each of CO2 through car emissions per year. The lowest emissions are maybe 100 kilograms. So even though we have that people have low emissions, they still have some emissions through car, car based um, car use. And th those car based emissions are up to 20 percent of their carbon footprints. So this is about place and, and, and mapping place. I found the map really quite handy, um, the, the carbon place map, just to give us a quick look at car ownership because someone has very kindly crunched the data for us. Um, 
on, on actual car ownership and, and mapped it to lower super, super output areas, the smallest um, authority areas that we have as uh, units of units of population. Um, and kind of not surprisingly, I'm sure no one, no one is remotely surprised by the fact that car ownership is lower in city centres and higher in the peri-urban areas outside of um, the centre of Manchester. And that car ownership is not just about um, how many miles people, it uh, has implications not just in terms of how many people uh, miles people drive, but also in the embedded carbon of, um, of the cars that they own, which ranges between six and 35 tonnes per vehicle. Um, then we have the carbon costs of the storage space of the cars, um, the infrastructure requirements of cars, the petrol stations, the roads, the, the general the parking, um, and, and the density that this causes that if you put a lot of space for cars on your streets, you then have to walk further um, if, you, if you want to make a, a, a um, journey by other means. Also, we, um, uh, we uh, when, when I, uh, at um, Como UK um, has done some research and shown that the more cars you have, the more you use them, which is very easy. Um, it, it, it's the utility argument. So if you have a car, you'll use it. If you don't have a car, you're less likely to use it. Well, obviously you're not going to use it, but you're less likely to use car-based transport. You're more likely to find ways of making your journeys in other, in, by other modes. So this is about trying to get a bit more granular understanding of, of why people are driving, what they're, where they're driving, and what we can do um, to um, tackle this car ownership and driving. And one of the most interesting things that I found over the, the course of the, um, the research was actually how far away people are driving into central Manchester from. Uh, if you just, this is just using census data from 2011, so it's kind of, um, it's quite old now and, and we'd hope for some refreshed data, but it's going to be a bit peculiar because of the pandemic. Uh, so using the 2011 data, you can see that central Manchester is that dark area in the middle of the left hand map. Obviously, there are lots of cars um, driving within central Manchester. Um, but those bigger areas, those surrounding areas, the nine other boroughs of um, Greater Manchester and the surrounding areas, those areas are generating a hell of a lot of car trips. And I think I calculated that when whereas you're getting 30 percent ish of cars um, within central Manchester remaining within central Manchester um, at the uh, destination of their commute, which, you know, their origin and destination of their commute is both within central Manchester. All of those other areas add up to 70 percent of the cars that are within central Manchester. So those cars are all coming relative distances into the centre of Manchester. And if you look at the areas um, around the nearest areas to central Manchester, um, you can see that those areas generate a hell of a lot of traffic. Um, you, you've got uh, areas which is highly, um, which are highly uh, uh, much more diffuse and highly car dependent. Uh, with people, um, with I think around about sixty percent of people in Bolton drive to work, whereas in central Manchester it's only about thirty five percent. You've got this. Uh, you, you've got a. a, a an interesting um, uh, fact that you've got uh, areas which are not even which are not urban by the World Bank's um, definition of urban of 1500 people per kilometre square in contiguous cells um, in that Greater Manchester area. It's much less dense than that central area of Manchester. So not all boroughs are the same. Fewer people are driving central Manchester, um, and uh, and then. Very interestingly, or maybe not a surprise to anyone, um, you have the the um, mapping of public transport within central Manchester. Look what happens: areas which are um, which are um, full of uh, which have good tra public transport. That area in central Manchester, that area of central Manchester, which has good tra public transport, is not is uh, an area where the least possible where the least driving occurs within central Manchester. Um, so, looking at this map, um, you've got uh, you've got um, this area. The, the the measure that is used in um, the measure that is used in central Manchester of um, 
of uh, public transport is called the GML score. It's very similar to the PTEL score in London, and it scores um, density of access to public transport on a scale of one to eight, um, with one being the lowest area and uh, eight being the highest area. And you can see the little dark blobs in central Manchester show that it has the highest area of uh, the highest um, degree of, cent of, um, of central Man of public transport. Um, if you look, you look at Bolton, which is on our, if you look in the, in the, our map of central Manchester, is out here in this area of um, dark blue, it has high levels of car driving. And then you look at how the, how the, um, how the population density uh, is distributed and the public transport is dense, is distributed. Um, you can see that Bolton, even Bolton is not, um, is not uh, consistent. Bolton is, um, it has some areas of high, high, pub, high population density in the middle of it, and it has some areas of low population density within it. And one of the things that I found very interesting in um, this research is looking at that population density. Uh, it's uh, in Bolton, I think it's around about um, 1900 people per um, per uh, kilometre squared. So, so, so it does qualify as a city in the, um, uh, under the World Bank's, um, or, or as an urban area under the World Bank's uh, definition. But it's actually very, it, it's very lumpy. 86% um, of it, of, of Bolton is, qualifies for this sort of definition, but 14% of it doesn't. And when you look at it, and you look at the size of it, this lumpiness starts to kind of play out in people's travel patterns, because you've got um, areas of dense um, population which are away from the um, away from the centre of the centre of Bolton and away from the centre of Manchester, and it, this lumpiness is very different from central Manchester. Central Manchester, ninety eight percent of central Manchester of the central Manchester population lives at, at this high density of fifteen hundred uh, people per kilometre square. Um, but out in Bolton, that drops to eighty six percent of the population. So you've got fourteen percent of people who live in really quite low density areas down to 200 people per kilometre square. Um, this lack of hom hom homogeneity means that people travel, make very different journeys from those in central Manchester, and it doesn't map to the public transport need that exists within the borough. Okay, so basically if you look at Bolton, people are travelling from to and through, and through low de density areas. And when you, when you start to look at um, individual journeys within um, the area, then you start to see what's really happening in terms of, of journeys. But for this work, I, I interviewed quite a few people about their travel journeys and the kinds of trips that they make and what, and my, my you know, without asking them why they drive, uh, finding out where, why they drive. Um, and one of the places I looked at uh, is Horwich. It's a town on the edge of Bolton, its population's uh, 20,000 people. It's kind of like worse than average, mainly worse than average for um, carbon outputs if you look at the carbon dot place um, uh, 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 tool. And it's, uh, and, and that is definitely part, partly down to the travel patterns that people have. Um, if you look at, if you look for where people are going with them, Bolton, Jobs ago, the majority of um, jobs are probably in the centre of Bolton from Horwich, um, and that's sort of eight to ten miles away. So it's not a small trip. It's not a walkable trip. It may be a cyclable trip if you feel that way inclined, but it's not a walkable trip. Um, and then others are scattered throughout Manchester, where you have the options of, of potentially the options of train train travel. Um, and it's this distance that matters. I, I, I've looked here, used um, the data shine tool here, which shows you um, the origins and destinations of commuting trips. And it's a really handy tool for um, looking at what people are actually doing. Um, let's have a look at see if I can now move this on next. Um, so I, my interview uh, with, um, with uh, one of my uh, interviewees is uh, she, she hates her tra travel so much that she'd rather work from home. And in fact, she was very happy at the time because she was working from home during the pandemic. Um, she enjoys being in the office. 
but her perception of travel is that she has to travel earlier and earlier to beat the rush. Um, and there are two forms of rush in her, um, in her life. One is the rush to get to the station in the morning because she drives to the station. Um, because uh, when I talked to her about the options, she was quite unhappy with any of the options that were presented. Um, and she, she drives to the station and the other rush is the train. She does not want to be on a completely packed train. Um, and they become more and more unreliable through the day for her return journey. So the earlier she can leave, the more um, likely she is to get a train on the way home and for it to work. So she, she leaves her house at 5.45 a.m. and arrives at work just before seven. And this is quite, this is a pretty long journey. It's already um, over an hour of um of travel and at an early, by by traveling early in the day and everything that you add to that hour of traveling two hours over just over two hours of two two hours ten per day um is going to um, have an impact on her on the things she likes doing um she's a, a runner a walker that wants to do outdoor activity uh, so she, though you know those are the things she wants to do i asked her about the alternatives so the bus only goes to bolton not to the train station she could get a, a, a train from this station in Black Rob, but the trains are much less frequent. Um, if she was to try and make a, an alternative to driving to the station, it would be the time penalty is at least 20 minutes. Um, and, and it introduces this additional dependencies. This is the thing that I find with people um, that they what they didn't like was unreliability and additional things that could go wrong within their journeys. Um, then, I also interviewed someone who was a keen driver, but also a keen cyclist, who um, lives, whose work is within the Warrington area. So his drive is throughout, is through central Manchester or round central Manchester or, or to the, around the edge of central or should be around the edge of central Manchester. Um, I, I can't really describe, I mean, he, he's, he's someone who likes cycling. He doesn't cycle every day, but every now and again, he likes cycling uh, and the, journey that he described as just put fear into me and I'm quite a keen cyclist in terms of if he wanted to make an addition a different journey it was quite a quick journey by bike he was quite he, he liked cycling because it actually his journey time was reasonably short with cycling it was shorter on the way there than the way back because of uh, hills um, but it was basically the way that any route that he chose would push him across motorway junctions, um, past parked cars, pushed into the middle of the road, um, and, and over roundabouts where you have a daily fear of death. Um, and I think this is, this is the issue that you, that you find in, um, outside of um, urban areas. You find that there is no infrastructure at all um, for cycling. The previous interviewee said she would very happily drop cycle to the station, but she thought it was too dangerous because there were no cycle lanes. Um, I'm not quite sure how, how I've got the previous there, if not next, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, you've got your, if you're travelling into central Manchester, you've got a problem because your journey is um, very much uh, um, based on uh, cars at some point and, uh, and then, but if you were working more locally, as many people do, um, what happens? Are you are you is, are you suddenly open to a panacea of beautiful public transport? And I'm afraid you probably won't be surprised to find that you're not. Um, public transport compare gives you an additional penalty of um, of over an hour of uh, thirty minutes to an hour and a half to an hour every day. And it's this it's these penalties that people are just not prepared to um, to countenance. Uh, if you look at these at, at this area, Horwich, it's this little dark area on the um, left-hand side of the map. Um, if you look at this area, it and you look at how Transport for Greater Manchester has um, assessed its uh, public transport rating, it's kind of got one to five basically, and those those one to five um, rate that rating doesn't means doesn't translate into use useful journeys. And I think this is one of the things that I kind of really worry about about these ratings is that they are points. They are points on a map. They are not lines. They're not um, they're not journeys and origins. They're you've got a bus stop, so it, mu it must be good enough, uh, and and that really isn't the case. We if you look at the map, 
you find that, that those buses that are between Bolton and uh, Horwich have about 40 stops on them. There's no way that that bus can be competitive with a car journey. It's a rational decision to take a car journey for eight to 10 miles if your bus has 40 stops and is timetabled to ensure that it, it, it um, deals with very um, unreliable, with, with very frequent congestion and, and um, turbulence in the, in the congestion. Yes, there are cycleways. You think, you know, that's great. There are some lines on the map, but the lines don't join up the places that people want to go. Um, and there are rail stations, but again, it's the reliable access to the rail station that causes people to drive to them. You have about one minute left. Um, yeah, I'm aware that we're that this is not, um, and and obviously the um, the uh, the uh, reverse is the true that Central Manchester has a has high scores even though they're points on a on a map and much lower car use. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling with this. Um, so the things that make thing uh, make journeys uncompetitive with cars, we kind of know these things: their distance, their friction, their fares, their compliance with rules, their journey time, their stops, their changes, their reliability, their shopping, their heavy items, and their costs. Um, but research by the um, uh, the uh, Transport Systems Catapult a few years ago said only 9% really love their cars. The rest are habitual or unenthusiastic users. So they're not, they don't love their cars. They want, um, they want their cars to, uh, they would be happy with changes. And the changes, are, it's really obvious that the cost of car, car ownership has to go up. So it's not at the point that, so it's not competitive to have two or more cars in your drive. The convenience of car ownership needs to go down. The alternative needs to be cheap, safe and attractive and um, suitable public and tra shared transport need to be there. And I think I think this is what the, the what I found most depressing is that there seems to be a complacency about those alternatives being safe, cheap and attractive. Um, the, the rest of my research looked at things like absent pavements. It's unbelievable in peri urban areas that you actually don't have pavements. This is a pa on the, the picture on the upper picture is a, is a school which is not served by a pavement on both sides of the road above it. You can't actually get to it by walking on pavement. Um, site segregated cycleways are the kind of obvious thing. Traffic calming, reducing on street parking, secure bike storage and parking. Um, and I think I, that, excuse me, just could I please ask you to wrap up? Uh, so I will wrap up at least, I, at least uh, two, three minutes for questions. <laughs> okay. Um, the, 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 the crux is that um, we can't have a single option um, that will um, that will answer which, which will replace cars. I think that the, the, when I'm talking to people, they will look for lots of different options. But they won't, uh, and none of the none of the um, solutions that we have at the moment will fold space and time in the way that we that they do with cars. So cars at the moment are pro producing are being that one one option, whereas we need to produce lots of different options. We need to have innovative public public transport. We need to have um, dense services. We can't just have a um, we'll try this for five for a couple of months or a, a, a year. Things have to be produced that are long term and uh, forward looking. Um, I, everything we I, I'm afraid I've, I've looked too much at the maps to go into the details on cargo bikes and rural areas, um, car clubs and community transport. So I think one of the most interesting things is that you find in these sorts of areas, Although people, where people live in slightly more community focused areas, they are quite happy to realise that resources can't be the same. You, you can wrap together several different um, services into one resource to maximise utilisation rather than expecting the kind of scale that things happen in, uh, in city centres where you've got a density and homogeneity of population. So I think that should be it. Um, oh no, I'm not. Quite, I'm really not using this very well. I'm terribly sorry, um, and we won't worry about mobility. That, that's okay. Service. I think. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> it's it's a, it's a great presentation anyway. So th thanks for spending more time on on maps because they were also fascinating to the connection between the, uh, the, the you know what maps can show us and also the personal stories of the people you interviewed. So that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, we can hear you, I think. Thank you, Carol, and good morning, everyone. Um, I suppose the first thing I should just mention is that um, although I work for you, Clan, um, you'll see I'm using Sheffield Hallam <laughs> slides. And um, it's because young Steve found himself to be double booked uh, and he felt safer asking me to stand in than to ask a good lady to forego some of their break. Um, so excuses, uh, apologies if I, um, if I stumble on one or two of the slides. Uh, so let's see if we can move to the next one. How do we do that here? Yeah. Ah. Okay, next, there we go. Right, so the team, um, myself, Mary at, at UCLan, and Stephen Parks and Tony Gore at Sheffield Hallam. Um, we'd just like to say thank you to Decarbonate for the, uh, the funding for this, uh, and also the local authorities who supported both of the teams in their respective areas. Uh, without their help, of course, we wouldn't um, uh, we were never able to do this and, and to get such a good response rate. So what did we do? This was study was looking at um, the road space reallocations uh, during the first lockdown and then subsequent travel behaviour after this uh, and how this changed over time. So we've been doing this since uh, since late uh, I think really we were looking at the, the period really from um, March last year, although the first survey didn't come out until later, asking people for a retrospective look. So we were looking at what the impact of, of the lockdown had on travel, on the impact of the road space reallocation. So did they use it? Did they type the tend to change and use this? Um, and then when things started to ease did they change back or did they they maintain that good behavior uh, and then we would obviously we've we've then gone back to them and, and sort of followed them over this period and there were the two areas that we are, uh, are looking at um unsurprisingly of course were <coughs> Lanc excuse me lancashire where uh Euclid is based and sheffield where shepherd howland is and that actually gives us two nice um, slightly different areas to uh, to compare. So this is some, in essence, what we we've done. Um, we've we've had uh, three waves of surveys. The first one, which went out in in uh, just after the summer last year. Excuse me, a moment. And um, th this was a much bigger survey. Asked for a lot more information. It asked for uh, pre lockdown habits during lockdown uh, and post lockdown uh, plus some other obviously information about general behavior in terms of travel um, things on active travel uh, and obviously demographic information uh, we then had a small follow-up survey in march and this was really just to see whether there'd been any shift in in how they traveled for their main travel purposes so for shopping for work going to school whatever that sort of thing um, again plus a couple of questions asking about whether they thought about alternatives again so just saving whether some of some of these alternative ways of traveling given the coverage that it's had uh, in national and local press is sort of entering their psyche if you like uh, and we followed this up again uh, in july and this one the summer one is just finished literally we closed it just over a week ago repeating the march one again looking at whether there's been some change in in their travel behavior for the main travel purposes um, and also whether again they've started to think about it and also an additional question just asking them sort of think ahead because we were i suppose all aware or, or that that there was an expectation that, that, you know, sort of September time, everybody would start to return to normal. So were they thinking about changing their behavior again or now they're going to stick with with old habits or stick with new habits, you know, that sort of thing. 
Um, and so with then after that, we're going to do some, we're going to, sorry, we plan to do some, some short interviews. Uh, right, let's just look and move this one on. So this is just a slide really giving you um, an overview of the two areas. But interestingly, you know, the, the, the and, and not, not surprisingly, really, Sheffield is a, you know, is a city region, it's much more densely populated. Um, uh, and there's a, you know, much more dense public transport network uh, across the, um, across the city. So, you know, one would suspect that we will see uh, some differences in, in current behaviour. Um, but it, it, it offered us a really nice, uh, a nice comparison. And also, of course, um, Lancashire has a couple of uh, interesting cases in itself in that Lancaster is a, a previous cycling city and um, demonstration city. And Burnley is, is uh, again, a place on the edge of the Pennines, nice and hilly, uh, with a, a larger than average ethnic population. So there were some interesting questions sort of sitting in the, in the back of that. Which, uh, which we're, we're going to be able to look at. Um, so again, a little bit more about what was done. As you can see, very similar uh, interventions. Uh, in fact, Lancashire did have, or have, are planning to have a low traffic neighborhood as one of their permanent interventions. Um, yeah, the, the list in Lancashire was slightly longer of things that were going to be done. Uh, but they haven't lasted as long. They've been removed much quicker. Uh, there was a lot, I think, a lot, um, a lot more of a, a kickback against it by by some residents and some perhaps more vocal politicians. So let's have a look at some of the data um, in here, and, and you can see that that, um, that, that there was um, quite a lot of people changed the mode. That they typically use um, uh, after lockdown or during lockdown from, from previously was much higher in, in Sheffield in all cases for all purposes, but particularly for the commute. I think that's probably a prevalence of, 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 of um, that there was a lot more public transport going on, people were shifting away from it mostly, um, and, and to more active travel. Again, it's a, a, a city. So the, the, the whole thing is in a much denser area. And then those are the sorts of things you, of course, would expect to see. Although I did notice um, when I was scanning through the data, um, somebody actually switched to public transport during the, the, the lockdown. So um, maybe they just saw lots of empty buses and thought, great, um, I'm happy to get on one now. It's, it's uh, that's someone we will certainly try and go back to and, and, um, uh, and, and ask some more questions of really, because that's, that's what we would like to do is really to um, to talk to one or two cases where where they you know uh, atypical behaviour really I guess. Um, I'll just switch my page so I can see what some where are we? Cool, my, my, my curse has disappeared. Uh, right, there we go. Um, uh, as you can see, for commuting uh, before, during and after um, what we've called private transport, but it's private motorised transport uh, has prevailed. Um, the, the interesting one was, I guess, that, that um, there was an increase in, in active travel, which is, is a positive one, and a, an increase in, in a mixing of active travel and uh, and, and, and private car. So that was one thing that I think we, we generally saw was there was much more of a mixing of, of modes. So whereas one to two uh, modes was the average pre-lockdown, during lockdown, that sort of went to two to three modes on average. So people were starting to mix it up a little bit more, which was, which was a good thing um, because some of them were coming away from cars, of course, not everybody was going to cars. But of course, it meant that the people were open to change. Uh, and, and if we are, uh, as been pointed out in previous presentations, going to get people to change, we need that openness first, don't we? Um, oh, there we go. 
I'll just go to the next screen. So we're looking now just quickly at Sheffield. Um, I suppose the thing to notice here, and you will see it again when we look at the next slide, is, is that um, uh, there's a much um, higher incidence of, of active travel uh, and public transport use in, in Sheffield and a much lower uh, incidence of, of private transport, cars and vans, company cars, that sort of thing uh, here compared to um, Lancashire. And again, that's again not unsurprising, really. Um, and there we are. I'd say quite quite a big difference, really. But it, Lancashire tends to be much more rural. Um, you know, although there are some some large centres, um, it's not surprising that, that we get less active travel, certainly. Um, and again, for shopping, uh, mostly car. Some some mix of active and and, and public transport, uh, and then there was an increase for for active travel only uh, during um, uh, during lockdown, and we saw actually a change in in um, in in the location people went as well. So I think there's a lot more local shopping going on uh, rather than sort of driving more distance. So perhaps more frequent shopping trips, uh, local shopping trips. Um, yeah, so between the two years, the, we asked people whether they actually considered alternative ways. Um, and as you can see, walking and, and public transport were still on the list of, of ways to travel. Uh, people did consider them even if they didn't shift to them, which is interesting. Interestingly, cycling is, is quite high there. Uh, I was quite surprised by that. Um, there tends to be a lot of resistance to it, but cycling is certainly going to offer us, if we're going to decarbonise transport, is going to offer us um, a, a great opportunity to do those sort of middle distances. Um, right, a um, couple of quotes really. Uh, we did consider them, uh, and, and yeah, distance, obviously. Uh, it's a nice, nice way to travel. Ideally, I'll walk and cycle for shorter distances, use public transport for longer ones. But they're just saying at the moment they don't travel. And I suppose that's something to bear in mind, actually, um, in, in terms of of, um, uh, of of all of these figures, that, that although we've seen what appear to be quite big shifts, the, the underlying trend was, of course, was not to commute at all. I think um our, our, of our sample around 18 percent didn't commute before the lockdown and that jumped to 63 percent during lockdown didn't commute at all so there's a lot of working from home uh, in both areas uh, that eased a bit uh, at the end of lockdown but of course as we know the work from home edict was still out there uh, and has only really just recently been lifted so i think the big change is, is yet to come uh, if we if we have that, um, there we go. And what we need to change for you to consider alternatives. So yeah, I mean, more frequent public transport. Uh, and again, we've we've already seen that in, in the previous presentation that you know if it's not there, people can't just can't use it, um, and, and therefore they have to take the car. Um, it's a little bit. Um, uh, chicken and egg situation, of course, with these things. You know, politicians are saying they're not used, but of course, if they're not there, they can't be used, can they? Uh, and there's lots of people side off-road protected cycle paths, and again, I think we saw a lot of that uh, with the temporary measures and, and where they were done competently, comprehensively. We saw a big increase in the use. People liked them. Uh, they felt safe using them. They took the children out on them. Um, that was, you know, that was great to see. Um, but I think where they were less well done, uh, the use was, you know, less frequent. Um, and and it's it certainly people need to feel safe when they're out and about for them to do that. Uh, and talking of the measures, there we go. Uh, quite high awareness of them. Lots of people not aware. Um, I, I think probably the 
uh, lower awareness levels are due to the fact that they're not local to lots of people. These were, these were not, you know, networks that were put down. These were odd interventions that often weren't joined up. So we had an unjoined up network to start with, uh, and we ended up with with little bits and pieces added in. Uh, so of course, not everybody was aware of them, and then not everybody used them. And again, we see. Um, half of those that were aware and didn't use them anyway because they weren't you know on their usual route so I say it was piecemeal interventions that, that really uh, didn't enable people to use them which is is a shame um, and again they want to encourage more cycling uh, in both Sheffield and Lancashire better segregated cycle lanes uh, reduce traffic which is the same thing isn't it it's about safety it's getting yourself away from cars and that that sort of thing. Cycle storage and, and, and the other things, of course, are, uh, are important. But I think uh, most of us remember how to cycle from our childhood. It's just making us, you know, uh, for someone who, who cycled in the 60s and 70s, uh, when the roads were much emptier, I felt safer, certainly, cycling in. Uh, Long term impacts, there we go. So, um, this, still, uh, car trips are going to dominate, unfortunately, for the moment. Active travel has become more popular, certainly for leisure trips. Um, as we know, a big peak in bike sales. Uh, and it's just really, I guess, how we capture that interest in, in cycling now and walking, uh, how we keep people doing it, how we get them to switch from leisure trips to to everyday trips and, and really keep the ball rolling uh, and, and don't allow behaviour to regress. Um, public transport as yet not showing any signs of recovery. Certainly in our survey, although I have seen and, and heard recently that uh, it's picking up significantly in London. So maybe again, there's a difference in, in areas. Change the number So there we go. Uh, yeah, some shifts as we can see number of commuter trips has fallen away, whereas the number of leisure trips has increased. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's probably a little bit of a convenience thing. We're all working from home. It's much easier, isn't it, to, um, to just bob out and have a little walk or a bike ride from home, uh, less so than from the office. Uh, so there we go. So in the final survey, as I said, we, we, we asked about what about the future? What about moving on from, from you know, I suppose September really this year? Um, lots of people anticipating some changes, uh, mostly to do with the return to work. Uh, lots of people sort of citing, well, once we're happy that everybody's vaccinated, you know, we might use public transport if there are still, you know, safety measures from that uh, on public transport, well, then we would. Um, still return uh, so summary and next two traps uh, similar changes um, both across both regions but you know Sheffield saw more uh, movement towards active travel and that again that's I think to do with the density of the area the nearness of, of shops and, and work locations um, th there is some some return, I think, to um, old habits, but there are some uh, some sticking of, of, of the new habits. We, we did ask people um, in the first survey whether they had changed back to old habits or not, or, or um, will keep sticking with the new one. And only 15% um, were still doing what they did beforehand. Um, to, to, to be 45 percent were the same as during lockdown about a third is different um, from both pre and during so we can say it's still an evolving situation um, so we'll, we'll wait and see i guess is a little bit uh, there's some other um things as well that, that um uh, we, we sort of observed in our initial looking at the data. Um, the next steps really for us are, are combining now these six data sets, which we've started to do. 
um, not easy for someone like me who doesn't find the technology easy uh, and SPSS isn't playing ball at the moment. Um, we, we've also decided to map the home and work locations with mode so that we can start to see whether there's some distance time barriers, as, as BT was suggesting, to, to switching uh, and by mapping some of the data we'll be able to do that. And then some further interviews with with um, uh, with other participants. Um, so just to sort of follow up some of these these um, these these questions really that have, have, have raised. You know, as I say, people like the um, uh, the guy that switched to public transport. Oh, that's it. I've gone and uh, go back to that one. Um, are you almost yeah, to, that's you're it almost i think i'm done so actually so. carol yeah i was, <laughs> was going to throw in one or two other comments but i think that's, Look, that's uh, fine please do you still have like 30 seconds so if you oh, oh right yeah well really um all, all, all i would say is is general observations is is that it seems to be that we've had um a larger change to where people go rather than how they travel there at the moment um there's certainly been a greater impact on what we call discretionary journeys so where people leisure journeys shopping journeys where there's more freedom uh, to make those changes there's been a greater change to mode um road space reallocations it's a real mixed bag i think sheffield has done better than us uh, in lancashire um i think lancashire probably withdrew them too quickly and they weren't joined up enough and I think, you know, we need a network of these things to make them attractive. Um, yeah, and, and things like public transport, I've already said, uh, it's going to, perceptions of safety really will, will get people back on trains and buses, which we do need uh, very much so. And, and again, as part of multimodal journey, so walking, cycling to the station, uh, train and the walking, cycling at the other end, um, uh, so we need not just bike racks at the station, which has been a favourite, but, but, you know, connected cycle routes from uh, the railway station to employment centres and city centres, that sort of thing. Yes, thank and you. That's it. Thank you very much. Apologies for that. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Zahra Batool. Uh, I'm working as research fellow for University of Leeds. And uh, I'm interested in bringing social and behaviour, uh, social and... Uh, uh, community changes uh, by bringing attitudinal and behavioral changes. Uh, the project I'm going to talk about today is uh, Vitalize, which is uh, visualizing active travel with Pakistani families living in Bradford. Uh, for this project, I'm being mentored by Dr. Kate Bengbon. Um, it's a six month uh, project and it's about to be start in uh, coming October. So for today, uh, I'm going to discuss Uh, is it moving? Uh, my screen is moving. Can you see my next slide? Uh, no, we're still on the on the first slide. Okay. Is it working now? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So talking about Vitalize uh, for today's uh, presentation, um, I wanted to discuss why we are doing this project and also uh, how we are planning to achieve it. So I will quickly give you uh, an overview of the project, uh, the rationale behind the project, and then the methodology which we have adopted to answer some of the questions. So why it's important to uh, look at active travel and black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. Um, first of all, in the UK, a million more journeys needed to be added. Uh, to meet decarbonization targets. However, uh, we do not yet walk or cycle enough, uh, especially for short trips to make a difference. Um, there are many uh, widely known reasons for that. For instance, people uh, don't uh, find it difficult to get out of the habit of using cars. Uh, there are not adequate infrastructure available, but uh, one of the leading concerns is also lower participation from 
certain communities. So that is why it is important to look at uh, BME. A recent survey conducted by Sustron found out that 74% of people uh, in ethnic minority communities are actually currently not cycling, although more than half would like to start. So we are particularly looking at uh, Pakistani um, heritage families uh, because uh, it is known that uh, physical activity levels, uh, especially in people from Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi heritage are quite uh, low compared to the national averages. So there are two challenges uh, which we want to address uh, through Vitalize. First is uh, how we can reduce car use, especially for short trips in the UK. And uh, second, how uh, walking and cycling uh, can be increased uh, within these communities. So we have chosen uh, Bradford uh, for our project. And the reason is, uh, it's uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Bradford, it is a fourth uh, largest city in Northern England. Uh, and it is very exciting in terms of its uh, socio-demographic composition. It's a young city and also it has the largest proportion of uh, Pakistani ethnic origin families uh, living in the UK. Uh, there is a lot of uh, things happening in the Bradford in terms of active travel. There are so many um, initiatives and schemes that are going to be introduced in near future. Uh, what else is important uh, when uh, we talk about Bradford is that, that uh, the city has one of the highest car ownership rate in the UK compared to national average, while it has the least percentage of people cycling uh, per week uh, in the country. Uh, there are 38% of people in the city who are living dangerously inactive lifestyle. And it is reported that one in three uh, year six children have an unhealthy weight. So there are different dimensions uh, other than decarbonization, which we are trying to address through this project. <clears throat> so keeping all these concerns in mind, uh, the idea of Vitalize is that, that how uh, we can ensure widespread engagement to achieve uh, UK climate uh, targets. And uh, it has been advised that widespread engagement is needed if we want to bring uh, societal and behavioral change that, that is going to sustain for a longer time. Uh, to achieve this widespread engagement, we are proposing participatory research approach. Uh, what does that mean is that, that we are proposing to uh, bring these uh, communities or the groups who are less representative uh, in the process of change uh, by working closely with them in close collaboration. And for this purpose, uh, we have identified that the key stakeholders are the local community members, uh, activists and uh, active travel champions, and those who are uh, responsible for uh, taking decisions. Uh, these key stakeholders uh, have been characterized uh, in three groups. So what you uh, are seeing here is the proposed engagement framework uh, for the project. Uh, so as you can see on top, uh, we, uh, by we, I mean me, myself and Kate are acting as research activist, activist, and we are going to be responsible for designing and implementing engagement activities. Now, what are those engagement activities and with which people these are going to be? So the second group is the group we call partners, uh, basically the community members. So we have put them uh, here in the project in a position of partners who will be responsible for co-creating knowledge uh, about uh, barriers and enablers uh, of active travel with the help of a technique uh, called photo voice. And what is photo voice? I will uh, discuss with you later on. But the idea is that, that we uh, should be able to develop a method uh, that could facilitate change uh, for people who are struggling to change their behaviors. Uh, on right hand side, you can see uh, collaborators or uh, this is the group of people who are practitioners uh, and activists and who are basically responsible for the CN making. So in this framework, we are proposing that uh, collaborators uh, should be engaged since, uh, since the inception of the project. And this is actually what we have done. Um, and they would be uh, responsible for co-building political and policy advocacy. 
now the knowledge which is going to be generated uh, by the uh, community members or partners is going to be uh, shared with those collaborators through an online uh, photo exhibition uh, event. And that would be an opportunity for all the uh, partners to co-engage for policy dialogue. So this is the framework for the project. Now talking about photo voice, what it is, it is basically a participatory methodology that empowers people to document their perceptions and understanding about particular issues using visual images. So for Vitalize, we want people to uh, talk about their everyday journeys by taking photos of what matters to them uh, in a travel environment, either good or bad. So this is basically an opportunity for them uh, to voice their opinion about what they would like to change in the environment or uh, what kind of changes uh, they would like to uh, bring uh, on ground that should meet, meet their social and uh, cultural needs. So it's not only uh, a reflective exercise, but it is also an opportunity for them to communicate directly with the um, uh, policy makers. Uh, within the uh, participants who are going to be part of the process, we are actually following a family-centered engagement approach. That means that we are looking forward to work at least with uh, a minimum of 10 households in uh, Bradford uh, with a good mix of uh, uh, children, young and senior adults. So once they will take uh, those photos, uh, we will sit with the families and we will discuss how they feel about walking and cycling, uh, what they would like to uh, change in their communities, and also uh, the ideas they would like to suggest to reduce uh, their car dependency and promotion of active travel. So talking about collaborators, uh, I'm very pleased to inform you that uh, we have managed to uh, partner with uh, some uh, key stakeholders here. So first and foremost, uh, City of Bradford uh, Metropolitan District Council. Uh, they are on board with us and they are helping us. Uh, they have actually helped us not only when we were um, uh, developing this project. In fact, all the partners did that. But also they are going to help us in uh, reaching uh, the right uh, kind of people and recruiting and in recruitment. Uh, with that, uh, we also have Bradford Capital Cycling. It's a um, collaboration of uh, community organization, um, charities and local activists and uh, who arrange some uh, events locally to promote uh, cycling. They also provide uh, training for cycling. Uh, on board with us are also Transport for the North and Department for Transport, uh, our regional and national uh, partners who are going to help us develop uh, policy, uh, political and policy advocacy for active travel, uh, keeping in view the need of BME communities. Uh, now through your screen, what you are seeing is the uh, engagement framework which uh, is being promoted, uh, which has been uh, proposed to integrate all the activities which we have planned for both partners and collaborators. So you can see that the project itself is divided into three key stages. Stage one is about planning and designing. Uh, stage two is about implementation and stage three is about results, dissemination, and also gauging the impacts of the project. So in stage one, the role of the collaborators and researchers is dominant. Uh, they have, we uh, work together to plan the project and to identify where we need to work at and whether the need, there is a need of such, such kind of project or not. So, so far we have completed the first three stages uh, steps in this stage. And now we are looking forward uh, for the recruitment of participants as soon as uh, the ethics approval has been sought from University of Leeds. In second stage, uh, that is uh, implement, uh, implementation stage, uh, that is more to do with the uh, partners uh, in the project. And this is the stage where we'll generate uh, knowledge and also we'll try to exchange that knowledge with the relevant stakeholders. And stage three is about producing outputs uh, with the help of uh, all three key uh, groups uh, and then uh, also doing some reflective exercises. Um, because this is a pilot uh, project and the idea is that um, uh, if we manage to do it successfully and if we have managed to integrate 
the working of both partners and collaborators and managed to achieve um, some good impacts. Then we are thinking to uh, transform this project to a wide scale uh, uh, engagement framework uh, that can be used uh, to engage uh, underrepresented or those communities which are low uh, in terms of participation. Uh, concluding remarks is that, that um, uh, as I have said, that uh, for this particular project, we have tried to do things uh, slightly uh, different than the conventional practice. So typically in academic world, we try to achieve um, impact through publications uh, once uh, we do uh, complete our project. So in this, uh, for this Vitalize project, we are, try we are trying to rely on participatory research and trying to learn whether uh, visual engagement uh, activities and also integration and providing opportunity to communicate directly uh, with policymakers, uh, whether there is a room uh, to make a change and is it achieve achievable. So hopefully um, in next six months or so, I'll be in a better position to give better insights on that. And with that, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, our funder, um, Decarbonate, for funding this project. Uh, this is uh, for may maybe not the first of its kind, but uh, something which has not been done uh, in that much depth before. So thank you very much. And that is it from my side.